Hi, my name is Scott Page. I'm a professor at the Stephen Ross School of Business at the University of Michigan. Welcome to Understanding Epidemics, a Many Model Approach. In this video, we're going to talk about networks and social structure and show how by adding these to our standard SIR model, we get a richer understanding of how disease is spread and we get much more subtle pieces of advice about how we should adapt our behavior and what policy should look like to prevent the spread of a disease. Now to do this, I'm gonna bring in an expert, Abigail Jacobs, who's a professor at the School of Information and in Complex Systems at the University of Michigan. And she's really an expert in thinking about networks and social structure and how that affects the spread of information, diseases, behaviors, and that sort of stuff. So to sort of tee up Abby, what I wanna do here is first remind us of the SIR model. So remember that there's a set of susceptibles, they can become infected, and then they recover. The model says the following. An infected person has contacts, that's the C. Those contacts with some probability are susceptible people. That's that S over the whole population. So if an infected person meets a susceptible person, then there's some probability that it spreads. If the number of contacts times the probability of meeting someone susceptible and it's spreading is bigger than the probability of recovering, the infected person recovering, the disease is gonna spread. If not, the disease will stop spreading. So the whole goal is to make the left-hand side of that equation smaller than the right-hand side of the equation. Now we could simplify that and create something called the basic reproduction number. And that's the number of contacts times the probability of spreading divided by the probability of recovering. If that's bigger than one, the disease spreads. If it's less than one, the disease won't spread. So the goal that we talked about in the previous lecture was reducing the numerator in that fraction, limiting the number of contacts by quarantining, seeing fewer friends, meeting in small groups, and then reducing the probability of transmission by wearing masks, keeping social distance, and those sorts of things. What we want to do now is expand that model to think about how we can include social networks. To do that, we've got to create something called the SEIR model. This is essentially the same as the SIR model, but we're adding a fourth state. The fourth state is people who are exposed, but not yet infected. So we're just going to add a fourth circle. There's susceptible people, infected and recovered people just like before, but now there's people who've been exposed to the disease, but they haven't quite been infected yet. And we're going to need that group in order to understand how social networks really operate. Let's move on and talk about networks. And we're going to use these networks to reason, right? We're going to use the network models to kind of understand, does social structure matter? And then we're going to use it to act. We're going to sort of see how, by thinking in terms of social structure networks, we can actually make wiser individual choices and policy choices. Okay, so this is our core question. Do networks matter? Abby, it's great to see you. How you doing? Hey, Scott. It's great to be here. Okay, we've got a bunch of questions for you. First, how does how people meet in real life, how we interact, differ from the random mixing model? That's a great question. So in the model I've been looking at so far, you've been working with something that's called a random mixing assumption. So let's just first dig into what that means. Let's assume that on average, say, an individual has contact with five other people. This might be the number of people they interact with or that they infect, but we draw these five people effectively at random, uniformly at random, from the broader population. So regardless of who that individual is, who they cross paths with, what their role is in society, they interact with five people uniformly at random. But we know that our social lives have a bit more structure to them. Our families, our friends, our neighbors, our coworkers, our schoolmates. We have patterns in our lives, we have patterns in our social contacts that drive who we interact with, how frequently, how we might see them, and generally sort of who our paths will cross with. So what we actually see in real life, if someone uh, interacts with others or exposes them to something, say an idea or a virus, we expect this to be not totally random, but actually draw somewhat on their distribution of contacts. That could be people in their physical or social lives. And so we'll see this in all sorts of ways, the ways people can uh, be grouped together through their schools or their homes or their communities. Okay, great. That makes perfect sense. So if I contact with someone who's got eight contacts, is that twice as bad as if I sort of meet with somebody who's got four contacts? Is it that simple that I just want to avoid people who have more contacts? Uh -huh. 
Well, the short answer will be that it depends, but let's dig into this. So let's say I'm an individual and I want to be, say, respectful of social distancing. I want to only interact with two others. In this case, let's say that the two I interact with, the two I potentially expose, come from two different, say, household units, communities, families, something, maybe different workplaces. And so in one case, one individual comes from a unit of four and the other comes from a unit of eight. What I might be worried about here actually is not just the two I potentially expose, but actually the second order effects, who they themselves then might expose. Can you explain in more detail what you mean by second order effects? Huh, great question. So let's go back to say an individual in a household or with some immediate close contacts. So we might expect that individual to expose uh, those in their immediate household, their close contacts, and, but let's say no one's symptomatic yet, everyone wants to be responsible, they have one you know, close other unit, everyone's limiting their outside contacts, and say, let's call this a dinner party. All four people in that family are exposed. However, we get to have this opportunity to think about these second order effects. So while well, we might see that everyone in both families becomes, say, infected, the second order effects are limited in that these families aren't interacting beyond their, their immediate circle. In contrast, let's imagine a different dinner party. In this case, maybe we'll draw one individual from each different household. Uh, say some come from other small family units, others come from a different community. Maybe we're drawing from different workplaces or different homes or different regions, and we bring these people together. In this case, our infected individuals not only expose their immediate contacts, but now has exposed people from different settings, different social worlds. And so here actually the second order effects mean that now we're actually concerned about not just, again, these individuals that were directly exposed, but everyone else that they will then potentially expose. So in this case, we now see potentially an infection spreading across a much larger portion of the population. And so instead of going um, from one to eight cases, we now go from one to 40. Okay, so let me see if I've got this right. So if I go and meet with six people who all belong to the same group, it's not gonna spread that fast. But if I go to a meeting with 20 people and each of those 20 people belong to 20 different social networks, it's gonna spread like crazy. So does that mean the person in the big group, like if I go meet in a big group, that I'm a super spreader? Is that what people mean when they say someone's a super spreader? That's a great question. In some ways, I think we don't want to get totally overtaken with this idea of a super spreader. So let's look at a really stylized example. Okay, let's say we have an individual who only exposes, say, five others. It's very clear the individual on the right, whether due to their social or professional position, if they're fulfilling some kind of essential role that requires interacting with a lot of people, or they're just a social butterfly who refuses to be held down, that individual has the potential to infect a huge number of other people. So again, these second order effects are really important if we think about who we're interacting with. But recalling even just the previous example, with each person that we're exposing, we have to worry about these second order effects. So again, one can be interacting with a small number of total people, but the number of people that they interact with can still be quite large. So even if we ourselves don't see ourselves in a particular uh, key social or structural role where we're going to infect many, many others directly, we still have that power to prevent or to <laughs> expose many others. So keeping this in mind helps us think about what our potential impact can have as individuals in the larger social structure itself. Just a couple more questions. These empirical network models can be used to aid in something called contact tracing. How does that work? Ah, great question. Contact tracing is trying to get at who might have previously been infected through contact with someone infected. So we're naturally thinking about some kind of underlying network, both of who an individual is interacted with, but maybe in this case, or who they shared physical space with, for instance. So we can think about trying to map this underlying network. But I want to note that while contact tracing helps us understand 
what parts of social distancing are being effective, for example, or what the best strategies to quarantine or distance others might be, it requires a lot of assumptions. In particular, on one hand, we require a lot of diagnostic tests to know whether or not those exposed have actually been exposed. It also requires, say, serological tests, knowing who has actually previously potentially had it, maybe had it and not known, maybe has immunity. Those who potentially are um, sharing the disease but not knowing it might actually have sort of muddied our picture here of who these contacts are and which ones we want to pay attention to. And so in some ways, contact tracing helps us understand and identify those who might be particularly susceptible or rather especially at risk due to exposure and how this might sort of flow as a network, but it also helps us understand what potential paths of infection might look like, especially if we're concerned about, say, particularly vulnerable populations. Exposure could be at potentially much higher risk, and so paying attention to those settings really uh, can help us inform, for example, decision making. Okay, so just to summarize this, then, if I, one big takeaway I want to have from this is that it's not just the number of contacts I have, it's who we contact and how many contacts they have. Is that correct? Yes, that's a nice note to end on. So it's not just the number of people that we interact with, it's also who we are in contact with, how we are in contact with them. Because again, we exist in a larger social structure we have the potential to reach a much larger world. We've already seen that the world is quite connected. And so using this to help think about what roles as individuals we can have as participating in this broader society really helps us think about how we can work together and contribute as individuals. Abby, thank you so much. That was just super useful. Thanks, Scott. I'll hand this back to you. So let's pull back a second and think about what we know. Remember, because our approach here is to use many models to understand epidemics. So the first model we did, the fatality rate model, focused on how people in different age categories have different fatality rates. And it's incredibly important that we limit interactions with people who are older until we have testing or until we have a vaccine. The second model we had, the SIR model, told us that there's something called the base reproduction number, which is the number of contacts times the spread divided by the recovery rate. If that's bigger than one, a disease is going to spread. If it's less than one, it won't. And so the goal is to turn the effective reproduction number, which is kind of what R is now, into something less than one. So we want to decrease the number of contacts and decrease the spread. So what are the implications of what we learned today? What we learned today is, in terms of our behavior, we should reduce the number of connections, just like in the SAR model, but we should also avoid people who have a lot of connections. So if we have a super social friend, we probably don't want to interact with that person because it's going to spread faster. Third, we want to avoid groups of people, even small groups of people, that have different connections. So it's not so much that we don't want to meet in groups larger than 10, we don't, but we also want to avoid groups of size eight or nine in which those eight or nine people each have completely different friendship networks. And then the fourth thing is it's very important that we're not super spreaders, which means we don't put ourselves in positions where we're somehow meeting 100 people or 200 people in one setting and possibly exposing lots of people to the disease. There's also policy implications. What the network models tell us is that one person could infect a lot of other people by it spreading through these networks. And so if we find someone who has the virus, one of the things we can do is find out who they've been in contact with and prevent that person, the second person, from possibly being a super spreader. And then the last thing that comes from this, which is worth keeping in mind, predicting a disease, predicting the spread, is going to be very, very difficult to do because micro-level social structures matter a lot. Thank you very, very much for listening, and I hope you're all doing well. Thank you.